Well, welcome everybody to all of our campuses meeting throughout the Twin Cities today. So glad you made it to church. Uh, making time for church really says something about the condition of your soul that you want to know God more or explore who God is. So I just want to applaud you a little bit for being here today, taking time out of your, your life and day to do that. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online around the country and world. We do consider you to be a part of our congregation. Know, we know you're out there joining us, so welcome to you as well. We, uh, today we continue our series called Done With That based on a new book about my personal struggle with a verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I have struggled with this verse if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life is come. But if the old life is gone, why do I still get angry sometimes? Why am I still selfish at times, say and do things I shouldn't? Why do I sometimes feel distant from God? Why do I still struggle with nagging insecurities? And these are just some of my issues. Uh, Paul says in Romans 6 that you've been set free from those things, but not really. <laughs> At least that's been my experience. About a month ago, my wife found some, some deck chairs on sale in one of the 80 magazines that come to our house every week. <laughs> and any conversation that begins with, I found some deck chairs on sale, has potential for conflict in our house. When she said they were marked down from $400 to $180, I thought, there's no way. Uh, plus, what a marketing ploy. You know, getting us to think that that's a good deal, $180 for some deck chairs, no way are we going to do that. After Laurie explained how rotten our other chairs were and unusable, which <laughs> they actually are, I finally agreed to go to the store just kind of as an outing, you know, just, just to do something, just to take a look. Well, an hour later, we came home with four new deck chairs <laughs> at the bargain price of $180 each. Do you know how much $180 is times four? A lot. And, and if you would have told me earlier that day that sometime during that day, Bob, you're going to go to a store and you're going to pay $720 for four deck chairs, I would have said you're crazy. Not in a million years would that happen. But there I was in my garage later that day putting together four new chairs, and I hadn't sinned yet, <laughs> but I was close, and I could feel it. Uh, the guy at the store said, just eight screws, easy to assemble. Well, there were 14 screws, and it took me an hour to assemble the first one. The, the guy at the store, by the way, was very gracious, just met him for the first time back there in the warehouse, happens to go to our church, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> It's just part of the story, so just hang with me. <laughs> Finally got to the fourth chair, and one of the screws didn't work because the hole in the chair was stripped. So I went over to my workbench, and I searched for 20 minutes trying to find a larger screw that I could kind of jimmy-rig this thing in, and my frustration was building. Just then, my wife said, well, Bob, maybe you're doing it wrong. <laughs> She said, maybe the screw goes in the other way. Now, using unusual restraint, <laughs> I said, no. Some chair guy overseas wasn't paying attention, and now I'm suffering for it. <laughs> but he's a zillion miles away, so what does he care? Laura said, Bob, I don't know. I said, she said, maybe just try it. So I turned the screw around just to appease her, and I'm telling you, a miracle happened in my garage <laughs> that afternoon. I couldn't believe it. The overseas guy was right all along. I had it backwards. I am embarrassed how often this happens when I think I'm right and everybody else is wrong, so I get mad, say bad things, think some other guy botched the whole deal when the whole time it was me. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man... But in the end, it leads to all kinds of problems. That could be my life verse. I always think I'm right about everything. It seems right to me. But in the end, it causes problems for people in my life. Anybody here, by the way, don't raise any hands. Anybody here think you're always right? So you go through life mad at everybody? 
or you're married to someone like that, don't, don't look at them. <laughs> or, you know, they're sitting next to you. You know, talk to them about it later on. Um, I want to be done with that. I want to quit making a mess of things. Got an email a while back. It's very typical of many that I get. Dear pastor, he writes, I need help. Every morning I start out with the best intentions to change my ways, and I think today is going to be different, but it never is. He says, somehow, I always fall back into my same old bad habits like there's a tug of war going on inside me. I want to do what's right, but I end up disappointing myself and God. He says, I've tried prayer, resolution, self-help books. Nothing seems to work. He says, why do I keep making the same mistakes why do I keep doing things that hurt myself and hurt others? I'm very discouraged and defeated. By the way, if you've ever felt that way, join the crowd. I mean, I have felt that way a lot. Paul said, if you're a Christian, the old life is gone, a new life has come, but the old life isn't completely gone. We all still struggle with sin. I do, you do, we all do. But So what did he mean that the old life is gone? What's gone? Well, we know that being separated from God is gone. If you're a Christian here today, Ephesians 2.12 says, you are no longer separated from God. You are in God's family. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, separated from God is gone. The penalty for sin is gone. Jesus bore the full penalty for your sins and mine on the cross. He took the penalty for our sin. So the eternal penalty for our sin is gone, and bondage to sin is gone. We all still will sin at times, but we don't have to be in bondage or enslaved to it. All of that's gone. What isn't gone is our tendency to sin. Because even if we're believers, most of us are here, Christians, we still have a sinful human nature that is still within us, really at war with God's Spirit, who also lives within us. The Bible says we are sinners by birth, every one of us, and by choice. But because of forgiveness, because of Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, we can overcome some or even all of this sin. Romans 6.12 says, so don't let sin control you. You can gain progress. Don't give in. To its desires, we still sin, but it doesn't have to control our lives. Last week, excuse me, I said that to defeat the old life, you have to do three things. You have to be led by the Spirit, God's Spirit, every single day, including today. God, fill me with your Spirit. Lead me by your Spirit. I need your power within. I can't do this by myself. Second, you've got to identify your signature sin. We all have at least one. It's just being honest. You might ask somebody, hey, where do I screw up? They'll tell you. Identify your signature sin, get honest about that, start attacking it, and then develop new desires. Because when we chase after God, you know, know what happens when we start chasing after God? He's going to change some of our desires into good desires. Most of us, but today is the key, and I told you this last week, today is the key. This is the fourth thing. Fourth thing. you got to get out of the middle. So important. You know, most of us uh, avoid the really big sins like murder. And Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Thankfully, most of us avoid those things, but we are, we are masters of the middle. Um, you know, we don't blatantly lie. Just shade the truth. We don't flagrantly use people. Just angle for favors. We don't commit adultery. We just secretly leer at people for a sexual jolt. Man, we love the middle. I love the middle. The middle is where people say, I want to fit into my jeans, but I'm going to eat a pint of ice cream every night. Well, that's a problem. That's not going to work. You know, I want to save money, but I want to take out a big loan and buy a boat. Well, <laughs> come on. I, you know, I want a great marriage, but I want to maintain all my old college friends. Well, good luck. You know, I want a happy marriage someday. But until then, I'm going to sleep around. <laughs> Not going to work. Psychologist Henry Cloud, just brilliant words. I've read all of his books, Christian man. 
He says, look, for the young people, especially here today, part of maturity is when you can let go of one wish in order to have another. The immature mind wants it all, like a two-year-old. But the most valuable things in life, a great marriage, great career, financial independence, vibrant faith, come with a cost, and you have to make hard choices. That means you have to get out of the middle. You can't have it all. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Most winters, my wife and I vacation for a couple weeks where there's a lot of grapefruit trees in people's yards. I love grapefruit, so... So when we go on our walks, we go on these walks every single day, I'm in constant search for for low-hanging fruit that I can grab and take home on the plane. But it drives my wife nuts. And you can feel the tension, literally, on our walks. Now, most people want you to take their grapefruit because it messes up their yard. So I'm actually doing most people a favor. And usually I do get permission, okay? But my wife is a rule keeper, and that's fine. So we have this ongoing debate whether fruit that's hanging over somebody's fence is private or public. (laughs) You know, the tree is in their yard, but it's hanging over on a sidewalk. And I figure, man, that's public. But she gets steaming mad. No kidding. Whenever I grab one, she boils over, she chirps away at me, and then she brings God into it. (laughs) Now, the last time this happened... She said this. She said, what, what do you think God thinks of that? I'm holding the grapefruit in my What do you think God thinks of that? I said, I think God could care less about that. She said, I can't believe it. You just lied about God. And it made me laugh, which made her even more mad. She said, well, you're going to hell. <laughs> Honestly, that's what she said. She didn't tell me to go to hell. She said, I was already on my way to hell. And it just made me laugh all the more. The problem is, I want to live in the middle. I want free grapefruit, but I also want a happy marriage. (laughs) But Laurie makes it clear, I can't have both. So I have to decide what is more valuable to me, free grapefruit or a happy marriage. I got to tell you, sometimes that's a tough choice. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. But seriously, there came a moment just a couple years ago when we were doing this, when I decide, you know what, it's, it's one or the other. If I keep snagging grapefruit, you know, over the fence, she's going to be mad for at least a couple hours. So here's my question. What's your grapefruit tree? What, what's that person, thing, habit, or experience that you want? You're drawn to it, but if you go after it, you're going to lose something even more valuable. So the reality is, there's this constant tug of war going on in our life between the old sinful life and the new life of obedience. So it's not uncommon to land somewhere in the middle where we try to have a little bit of both, a little bit of sin, a little bit of God. Paul pleads with us in the New Testament to leave the old life completely, clean break, don't even get near it, and live in the new life. And he uses interestingly, an analogy of a slave. So in Romans 6, 16, he says these words, don't you know, all of us who are believers especially, don't you know that you are like a slave to the one whom you obey? Either a slave to sin, which leads to death, or a slave to obedience that leads to life. He says, you and I are kind of like a slave to something, either to sin and death or obedience in life, and there's no in between. So if you think about this, if you and I are a slave, we are bound and constrained to something. And he says, there's only two options. You're either a slave to sin and death or obedience in life. So what are some sins that people are enslaved to? Well, Galatians 5, 19, Paul gives a list of sins, and you can find these lists throughout the New Testament. But for example, he says, look, the sinful nature, these are some things that people are enslaved to. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, their whole thought life is impure. Selfishness, jealousy just rages inside them. Lying, hatred, quarreling, rage, drunkenness and strife. And he says, all these things, you can do these things, but they always lead to death. On the other hand, 
you can choose a life of obedience that leads to life. But a lot of people look at these lists and they say, well, you know, this looks so boring. You know, lovey-dovey and joy and peace and, you know, goodness. and Who wants to be self-controlled? I want to lose control a little bit. So what a lot of people do is they say, well, I don't want to live in the sewer that brings death to me. But I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to live all over here either, even though it brings life. Here's what I want. I want to live somewhere in the middle. This is what I want. A lot of people say, a little bit of God, a little bit of sin. You know, I'm not going to have an affair, but what's wrong with a little soft porn? You know, I'm not going to be just raging at people, but I'll tell you what, I'll hold a few grudges. And I'm not going to get stone drunk. I'm not going to become an alcoholic, but man, I enjoy a buzz once in a while. Critical spirit, hot temper. I'm not going to be a liar, but I'm going to deceive. Getting even impatience, bachelorette, I'm just going to soak that in. It's not porn. Come on. It's the way of the world. Until your 14-year-old girl, daughter, you know, gets a mindful of that. And she thinks this is how true love is found. And she ends up scarred and wounded for life. Here's the problem with the middle. The middle is the most miserable place you can be, if you're a Christian especially. The most miserable person on the planet is the person who says something like this, I want to be a Christian, I want to be good with God, but I also want to be selfish, greedy, lustful, and foolish. I want to party wherever and with whomever I want. After all, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Only it doesn't. I hate that line. That is such a lie. What happens in Vegas follows you home in the form of regret and loss. Now, if you're not a Christian here today, and I'm so glad if you're, if you're joining us online and, or here and you're not a believer yet, I, we're, in many ways, this is why we have this church, why we built this church. It's for you. But if you're not yet a believer, again, you're welcome here, always welcome here. We love that you're here. But you probably don't feel much guilt yet over some of this. Because that's just been your lifestyle. Not a lot of guilt. Almost don't even know any better. It's actually destroying your life. But you might not be bothered by that much guilt. And this is the thing that is blocking you from getting for, going forward in every area. Relationally, financially, career. On the other hand, if you are a Christian, I'm telling you, the middle is the most miserable place you can be. If you try to live with a little bit of God, a little bit of sin, you're going to be the most conflicted, guilt-ridden, defeated person on earth, which means it has to be one or the other either devoted to sin and death or obedience in life, Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. It just can't be done. You either serve the master of sin or the master of obedience. You can't live in the middle. Now let's say you're going to be devoted to following and serving Jesus Christ. You're going to pursue the values of love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That means you're going to need to be a slave to obedience. Bound and devoted to obedience. Doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? Sounds terrible. Sounds like a real drag. But stay with me. You can still hunt. And you can still fish and play golf. Only do that without sinning. That's all that it means. You can still work out and enjoy food. You can still fill your luggage with grapefruit and stuff it in the overhead bin, which I do every single year. Just do it without sinning. Some people think if you become a Christian, you know, you got to become all pious and boring and give up skiing, hiking, and fun. No, you can still do what you love, only do that without sinning. And I'm telling you, it's so much better. Not even close. 
I would rather be on a hunting or golf trip with guys who love God, are faithful to their wives, and can't wait to get home to see their family than with guys who sit at the bar getting sloshed, hitting on women. Those guys, I'm telling you, go home to their families feeling a little more dead inside, a little more defeated. And by the way, if that's you, you can make a decision today to stop that. You can start living a new life that breathes life into your soul and into your marriage and into your family if you're married. Point is, if you're a Christian, you and I are bound and devoted to obedience. You are not free to do certain things. You're not free to go to certain places, be with certain people, or view certain things on the websites. By the way, as your pastor, I am not free to be dishonest. I'm not free to flip people off, even though I'd like to sometimes. I'm not free to cheat on my wife, but not because I'm a pastor mainly, but because I'm a Christian, devoted, bound and devoted to obedience. And I'm telling you, gang, the payoff is is so worth it. It is so worth it. When we choose to obey God, here's the deal. He will bless you in ways that you can't predict. Unbelievable ways. He will honor you, protect you. He will fill your life with so much bounty and so much intimacy with the people that you love that you never thought this was even possible. If you obey God, he will fill your life. Bible says when you're a slave to obedience, it leads to life in its fullest extent. But when you're a slave to sin, the Bible says it always leads to death. He says, look, when you were slaves to sin, you were free to do what you want. You are free from the control of righteousness. You are free from the control of right living. You could go do, be, whatever you want to do. You could sleep with her. You were free from any kind of controls or constraints. But he says, what result did you get from the things you are now, here's the key, ashamed of? Those things always result in some sort of death to my soul, my marriage, my relationships, my career, you name it. God gives us freedom to do whatever we want. But the result of sin is Always some sort of death. So I just want to raise a question for all of you to think about. Is anything dying around you or in you? Because that's how you know if you're enslaved to sin. If things are dying around you, are are your relationships dead or dying or are they alive? Is your joy, do you have true joy? Is that alive in you or is that dead or dying? Is your ability to be generous alive in you? You just want to be generous toward people. Is your passion for God and worship, is that alive or is it just flatlined? If things are dying around you, that's because of some sort of sin. The wages of sin, the predictable outcome of sin is always some sort of death to my spirit, my relationships, you name it. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a life where everything's dying around them, but that means you are not free to go do or indulge in whatever you want. You need to become, to use Paul's words, a slave to obedience. Some of you know the name Alex Honnold. Uh, Crazy man. Alex Honnold is an extreme climber. He holds world records uh, in climbing. Three years ago, he did the unthinkable And he climbed El Capitan without ropes or gear. Never been done before. A team of eight climbers captured his climb on film in a documentary called Free Solo. You ought to watch it. El Cap, some of you have seen it. I've seen it in person. Is this uh, massive wall. It's the most impressive granite wall on the planet. 3,200 feet high. In this documentary, Alex says this. He says, the hardest part that terrifies me is Teflon Corner. And there's various names for different places on El Cap. And Teflon Corner terrifies him. He says, I have fallen many times with a rope roped in on Teflon Corner. But on this climb, he was going to do it without ropes, without gear. He says, you're standing on tiny ripples 
in the wall, one slip, and it's over. On the day of the climb, uh, all his photographer and friends and coordinators who were with him on this climb thought that this might be Alex's last day. There was a morbid feeling. There was a morbid conversation. And on camera, away from Alex, they were talking about the fact that this might be the end. Um, Larry or Tommy Caldwell is one of Alex's best friends, also a climber, said 30 of his friends have died climbing. Friends like Dan Osman, you can see Osman's climbs on YouTube. Osman took free soloing in a different direction. Osman would tie a rope. He he would climb a, a, a you know he would he he would climb a, a mountain or a, a sheer rock like this. He would tie a rope to his belt, and there was another rope across the canyon tied from one end to the other, and then he would leap off the cliff and just swing uh, between canyon walls. I watched several of Osman's jumps on YouTube, and people asked him if he had a death wish. He said, not at all. I just want to feel the rush of, here's the word, falling without constraints. Falling without constraints. But then I came to a video titled The Late Extreme Climber Dan Osman, and I was sick to my stomach as I watched Dan fall to his death when the rope snapped, leaving his four-year-old daughter fatherless. Alex Honnold on this day survived. It was incredible. Um, but his friends believe a fatal mistake is inevitable. Because a life, I'm telling you, a life without constraints inevitably leads to some sort of death. Paul wrote it this way, when you are slaves to sin, you are free from the control, from the constraints of righteousness, of right living, of making right choices. You are free from that. But what was the result of that kind of freedom? Those things always result in some sort of death. He says, if you are a Christian, there are constraints on your life. It means you are not free to do certain things, be with certain people, or go to certain places, because if you do, things will start to die. Maybe not right away. Maybe sometimes it's a slow death, and you just wake up at age 50 and wonder why you're so broken and alone. So that leads to one more question I want to raise for you. How can we win the battle over sin? We all still will sin. We're not sinless, but how can we sin less so things don't keep dying? And here's, here's the answer. Stay out of the middle. Paul says, don't you realize that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master? Key word, obey. Whatever we choose to obey becomes our master Obedience to things on the right, you know, those things we looked at on the right. Obedience to things on the right weakens my desire for the things on the left. So real quickly, three summations. First of all, we all have a choice between sin and death and obedience in life. And we face this choice hundreds of times a day. I was golfing Friday morning real quickly, and I sat down on a bench just to take a break on hole number oh, 15 or 16, can't remember. And there sitting next to me on the bench was a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses. Oh, they were sweet. I mean, they, and I put them on, and they fit. And it, it, it was a moment. And I've learned, you make a decision right away. And so we, you know, my partner and I, and he had a caddy, and we gave the pair of glasses to the caddy and said, make sure that the clubhouse gets these. Earlier in my life, I wouldn't have done that. Obedience weakens my desire and its grip on sin. The more I obey, the less I'm going to be drawn into that. We all have a choice. The middle is miserable. If you live in the middle, gang, if you live in the middle, the, the drift is always this way. 
Look at this list. The drift will never be that way. It will always be this way, and you're going to end up losing things. If you are getting too close to a colleague at work, and he or she is not your spouse, if you maintain friends who aren't good for you, if you ignore the addiction, an addiction that is eroding your spirit, if you give no thought to your entertainment choices, if you miss church several weeks in a row, you are going to lose something because if you stay in the middle, the drift is always toward blatant sin and death. Finally today, no matter what you've done, you can start a new life today. Because here's what I know about some of you. Some of you are sitting here listening to this mess and you're thinking, Bob, I've blown it so badly. There's no hope for me. I am beyond repair. I am beyond forgiveness. If you knew what I, had, what I have done in my life, you would just give up. Well, God has not given up. There is hope for every single person here. And there's forgiveness available for every sin ever committed, but some of you are trying to free solo without any ropes, without any constraints, unwilling to submit to God's truth or take direction, so you drift in and out of the middle without any boundaries, and gang, you're free to do that. You can do that, but God says it never ends well, but today you can get out of the middle. You can be done with the old life and start living a new life. I want to show you one more verse, and this, this verse is why many of you are here today. This is going to stay with you all week long, I hope. If you're a believer, the Bible says there is right now, right now, absolutely no condemnation, not an ounce of condemnation, not a single speck. There is right now no condemnation. And here's the qualifier for those of you who are in Christ. Doesn't matter what you've done. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, look, believe this. Right now where you're sitting or where you're joining us online and watching, right now there is absolutely no condemnation for whatever you did. Some of you lost your marriage. You committed adultery and it was your fault. And you've, you've lived with this guilt. And you think, I, it's, it's just not forgivable. It is. If you put your faith in Christ, there's not an ounce of condemnation for you. Consequences, yeah, they linger. Some of you have had an abortion. And you have lived with such regret and such loss and such pain that they never tell you about. You'll never hear politicians talk about that. But you live with that every single day. And you think, how could God forgive me for taking a life? But I'm telling you, there is right now no condemnation for those of you who've put your faith in Christ. Some of you battle a raging addiction, and it gets in the way of everything in your life. God wants to free you of that. But just know, even though you're battling it, there is right now no condemnation if your faith is in the Savior. Um, next week, we're going to conclude. Actually, Jason Strand's going to conclude this this series, and he better do a good job because it's on the last four chapters of the book I wrote. But it's really about not being perfect, but making progress. And it's going to be a powerful message, so you, you want to come back and be a part of that, and God will speak to you, I'm sure, through him. But I want to ask all of you to stand in prayer at all campuses. I want to pray for two kinds of people here today. People like me who sometimes drift in the middle. And I want to pray for those of us who are Christians who kind of spend too much time in the middle just to make a new commitment. Get out of there. Start pursuing God with a new commitment. 
Then I want to pray for those of you who are not yet Christians and you haven't taken that bold step of faith. I want to lead you in a prayer. And if this is your day to make that step of faith, be the best prayer you ever prayed. So let's close real quick. God, thanks so much for your love for us, your patience, your kindness, your forgiveness. Your forgiveness is something I need every single day because I sin just about every day. God, I pray for all of us who are believers who just spend way too much time in the middle between sin and death and obedience in life. And we tiptoe around the edges and we think it's okay and it's not. God, I pray that you'll help all of us identify where the danger spots are and just have the courage and strength and wisdom to make a clean break, no turning back. God, I pray for those who are standing here or watching online who want to take this step of faith and receive your forgiveness. So this is your prayer. I invite you to pray it quietly where you are, just be between you and God. I'll lead you. You don't need to pray it out loud. God knows your heart. Go something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me in spite of what I've done. Thank you for offering your forgiveness to me. Not because I'm a good person, but because you're a good God. And so right now, right here, I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, I am putting my faith in you as my Savior. The one who died on a cross to pay for my sins. I am putting my faith in you and then who rose from the grave so that someday by faith I too might rise from the grave. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. Clean away the junk. Put me on a better path. Give me new life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Real quick, if you prayed that prayer, text, begin. 555-888. We just want to give you some tools to start growing in your faith. Stop at next steps table. God bless you all. Thanks for coming to church today. Have a great day, everyone.